Yesterday, this was just virgin grass, but today, as you can see, we've dug a great big hole. Why? Because we're looking for the mysterious Manila House. What's the mystery? Well, we don't know what it was for. Was it called the Manila House because it's where they manufactured the Manila bangles, which they used to trade with the slave traders, or was it just an office space? What do we know about it? We definitely know that Thomas Costa, one of the founders of the White Rock site, built this essentially in order to get involved with the slave trading, and Manilas are a key aspect of that. We also know that it's labelled on this map as the Manila House and Pay Office, but beyond that, archaeology has to answer the questions. And has the archaeology told us anything yet? We've got a stone wall over there, yeah. and stone normally means 18th century, but we're not sure yet. There's no stopping Matt as he gets digging to find the Manila house. And to understand what it took to make a Manila, we're crafting one of our own, starting with a sand mould that needs to be hammered flat. I take it this isn't the most skilled part of the process, though. No, that, but you're doing a great job. You're Thank doing you. A great job. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Having failed to smelt copper yesterday, hopefully we'll have more luck with casting it. Hey, the moment of truth here, you flip it. We're using a manila bracelet right, manila, to create a depression in the sand, then pouring molten copper into the hollow. That's our two-piece mould, and then once the copper alloy is ready, we'll yeah. be pouring it. And right, that's okay. it done. White Rock would have churned out thousands of these bracelets using copper made in the great workhouse. For two days, Phil's been puzzling over what sort of furnace he's found. Now it's all cleaned up, it's clear this was a calcine or roasting furnace. Tell me what it would have looked like. Well, we've got a squarish one, it's very large. Um, fire over that way, it's got the floor just about at this level. All drops in from the top, big hoppers dropping in three tonne at a time. All gets raked out into this pit at the bottom. Fire over there, sucking Live. the flames along here to be taken away up that massive chimney stack. And then how does it drop through into the pit then? Ah, well, what you've got is you've got holes positioned down the sides where we're standing. This right. is where the guys with the rabblers would stand, which is like a long kind of rakey, rakey number. And you poke it in through the hole and you rabble it out and it drops through a tube into this pit just here. And then how does the ore get from the raking out pit out there? What would happen with the raking out pit is your furnace man is in charge of that. So he comes in at like 4 a.m. and he shovels out your three tonne of ore like that. And then it's the same guy's job to come and get the coal in for the next day. So with these big wheelbarrows, he brings all the coal they'll need for the next firing. So, I mean, once all that calcined ore has been shoveled out, where does it go then? Well, it should move to the next furnace down in the process. So it's going roasting, melting, roasting, melting, as it works its way down. This looks like one of the first furnaces in the great workhouse sequence. Work here was gruelling. Average life expectancy was below 40. They were affected in their lungs and stomach and frequently would spit blood. When the conditions became unendurable, they'd have to rush to the door. And it's not just what they're breathing in, it's the temperatures that they're working in as well. It's suggested by Dr Thomas Williams in 1854 that a copper man could sweat about 600 gallons in a year and consume as much as 1,000 gallons of water to replace it. Yeah, awful. These men are suffering long-term, slow-burning poisoning from these really noxious chemicals that they're uh, ingesting into their bodies. Yeah, why not? In Phil's trench, the archaeologists are getting close up and personal with those horrendous conditions. At this end, they've dug test pits, hoping to find another copper furnace. But they've actually uncovered something very different. What's happening is it is actually filling in a lot of the gaps of the later history of the works here. Because when we started to go through the, the, the topmost layers, uh, of that test pit over there, squeezed in between the bricks, 
we've got evidence of lead. So the only way that lead could have got in there would have been in a molten state. So we know that in here they're processing it. But have we got fines, Phil? Have we got fines? Yes, we've got fines. Oh, you've got the heavy fines, aren't Absolutely. You? If that is a, the product of the lead working, it should have been transported out because what you're holding in your hands is money. Yeah. If there's something wrong with it, then it should be going back into the process and to refine it so that it can be made into good lead to send out. So it seems White Rock started as a copper works, but diversified into lead production by the end of the 19th century when it became cheaper to make copper abroad. Unfortunately, there's nothing left of the huge furnaces that once dominated this building. 